week with David Brinkley. Now, from our Washington headquarters, here's David Brinkley. They come from Central and South America. If there's a fence, as sometimes there is, they cut through it. Then they wade the Rio Grande, and the Border Patrol is unable to stop them, about a million a year. While the Coast Guard on the East Coast tries to stop overloaded, leaky boats trying to slip their immigrant passengers ashore at night. Some make it, some don't, some drown. Once ashore, they disappear into the big cities and can never be found. More recently, on the East and West Coasts, boatloads of illegal Chinese immigrants arrive in boat trips arranged by gangsters who charge thousands to bring them here, and once they're here, work them as slaves to pay off their debt. While Americans wonder, A, what to do about it, and B, how this country can survive incoming waves of poverty, disease, and crime. What can we do? We'll ask today's guests. Attorney General Janet Reno, who will have to enforce whatever laws there may be. Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat, California, of the Judiciary Committee, where immigration laws are dealt with. And Dan Stein of the Federation for Immigration Reform. Some background from our man Jack Smith. And our discussion here with George Will, Sam Donaldson, and Jim Wooten here on our Sunday program. First, a little news. There isn't much, but on Father's Day, the Washington Post reports that President Clinton may have a half-brother previously unknown. His name is Henry Ritzenthaler, and he says Clinton's father had a son by another woman several years before he met Clinton's mother. The White House has no comment. Clinton's mother said this is all news to her. We'll be back with today's program in a moment. This week with David Brinkley, brought to you by GE. From aircraft engines to appliances, we bring good things to life. And by Merrill Lynch, we're bullish on the future. A new chapter has begun in Merrill Lynch's history in Asia. We are the first American securities firm invited to open an office in mainland China. Being there gives our financial consultants a different perspective, which makes a difference for our clients. The difference is Merrill Lynch. To experience the true joy of cooking, it must be pursued with reckless abandon and total disregard for the inevitable splatters, spills, squirts, and the occasional splash. Fortunately, GE's profile cooking appliances have ingenious quick-clean features like lift-top ranges, self-cleaning ovens, easy wipe surfaces, and sealed burners. So they clean with just a wipe. GE's profile appliances are so easy to clean, they take the joy of cooking to new heights. A middle-aged woman wrote to us as follows. Will I or my children see the end of our United States as we have known it? Will we see the end of our 350-year-old legal and social systems and our language washed away in a flood of immigrants, legal and illegal? While we who have lived here for generations are allowed to have nothing whatever to say about it. The question in various forms is often asked and seldom answered. It's being asked now with a new urgency because it is clear now that gangsters are in the business of bringing illegal aliens to this country for a price. Here's some background from Jack Smith. Jack? David, the bungled smuggling attempt that saw eight Chinese die in the surf off New York City has drawn attention once again to the problem of immigration. The hiring of this couple and our failure to pay the appropriate taxes at the time was wrong. From nominee Zoe Baird's admission last winter she had hired undocumented aliens to the soaring number of illegals once again pouring over U.S. borders, it seems immigration policy isn't working. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, says the inscription on Lady Liberty, the proud emblem of the country's immigrant past. But today, more and more Americans think we ought to shut the golden door she's held open because too many illegals are getting in. Come on. Come on, guys. The latest wave is Chinese. Roughly 100,000 enter the U.S. illegally each year, drawn by the newest loophole in U.S. immigration law. 
After the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, the Bush administration relaxed the rules for Chinese refugees. The resulting chaos is symptomatic of problems within the whole Cold War asylum system. If you can think for a moment and see the icon of the Statue of Liberty dissolving and being replaced by the World Trade Center after it was bombed, you get a sense of the negative direction of the discussion in the United States at this point in time. The recent disclosure that suspects in the World Trade Center bombing managed to stay in the U.S. by manipulating the asylum laws didn't surprise some. If you say the magic words, and a lot of people are coached to say them, that I claim political asylum, I'm afraid of being persecuted, and they pay people to train them how to do this, then there are no other questions asked. More than 100,000 claims for political asylum are filed each year. Many, perhaps most, are bogus. The Immigration and Naturalization Service has a backlog of a quarter of a million cases and 150 officers to handle them all. Most applicants are released into the community and simply vanish. Word has spread to the four corners of the globe that it's very easy to come to America, claim asylum, and then nothing will happen to you even if you don't deserve asylum and never show up at the hearing. Bad as the asylum problem is, the biggest headache for immigration officers remains the border with Mexico. It's very difficult to be effective in trying to do the job uh, when you're dealing with masses as we're dealing every single day of the year. 2,000 illegals a day are arrested south of San Diego, more than a million a year along the entire U.S.-Mexico border. The much vaunted 1986 Simpson-Mazzoli Immigration Reform Act with its employer sanctions that were supposed to turn off the job magnet drawing illegals north, isn't working. There were some people who hoped that it would solve the whole problem of illegal immigrants. It hasn't because there's a massive industry of uh, fabricating documents that serve as the basis for people's claims to be here to work. A legal immigration of between 250 and 500,000 a year is once again placing a heavy burden on the major ports of entry. California, in particular, hard hit by the recession and broke, cannot afford to pay billions for the schooling, welfare, and health needs of the 100,000 illegals who come there each year. You are imposing a burden on state taxpayers, which certainly in this state, is causing us to actually have to cut the kind of care that we would give to our own residents. Now, that's just not fair. There are more than 20 bills before the California legislature this year to curb immigration. And public officials everywhere casting their eye to the violence in Germany worry about a backlash in the U.S. against immigration. We can't afford to lose control of our own borders at a time when we are not adequately providing for the jobs, the health care, and the education of our own people. The president this week finally named someone to head the immigration service, which has been rudderless for five months. Doris Meisner, a respected former immigration official. I promise to devote every effort to meeting the challenge that this assignment presents. The president also announced a crackdown on today's most visible problem, the smuggling of illegals into the U.S., especially Chinese, by organized gangs. But the president has yet to articulate an overall immigration policy. During last year's campaign, for instance, he criticized the Bush administration for repatriating Haitians. If I had been president, I would not have done that. I think that was wrong. But later, fearing a Haitian exodus, he embraced the Bush policy, even leaving it up to the courts this week finally to close the notorious Haitian detention center in Guantanamo Bay. In fairness to the administration, though, neither political party has yet articulated a coherent immigration policy. But clearly, something needs to be done, both about the process of asylum and to curb the flow of illegals. A tall order for the new commissioner and her boss, the attorney general. David? Jack, thank you. Coming next, Dan Stein, director of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. And shortly, Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat, California, a member of the Judici Judiciary Committee. And Janet Reno, Attorney General of the United States, whose duties include enforcing the immigration laws in a month. Every year, the importance of this land increases because every year there are a lot more mouths to feed. Over 95 million more, a figure greater than the population of Mexico. Fortunately, the food ingredients that Archer Daniels Midland makes from America's harvests can help feed people the world over. Food ingredients such as flour, protein, vegetable oils, and corn sweeteners. Making food and feed ingredients to meet our growing nutritional needs. That's why ADM is supermarket to the world. Add the following line to your auto-exec.bat file. Chapter 4, 
troubleshooting. You well, told me you can do this. Would you help me on this, please? I'm trying. What? File not, it says file not found. You lost the presentation? So if you want to just call the support line, try it again, please. You sure you guys know what you're doing? <laughs> if you want a computer that's easy to use, there's still only one way to go. Quality results depend on making the right investments. And at Ford Motor Company, that begins with our employees. We invest over $20 million each month in the continuing education and training of our employees. And they, in turn, teach us new things every day. The bottom line, increased motivation and an obsession with quality. At Ford, an investment in education is an investment in quality. Ford Motor Company, quality is job one. It's working. Monday on day one, it's your worst nightmare. You're declared dead, but you're not. It sounds like a horror film, but it actually happens. We've got this dead body down here doing things I've never seen a dead body do. How can this be? I had nightmares for years about being buried alive. Day one, Monday. Mr. Stein, thank you for coming. Thank you. Pleased to have you. Here in the studio with us are George Will and Sam Donaldson, both of ABC News. Now, the Federation for American Immigration Reform. Is this a hobby of yours? How did you come to this? A well, fair was actually formed by people who recognized that worldwide there is explosive population growth and exponential growth of labor markets in countries like China, India, Latin America, some parts of the East Bloc countries in Africa. And that during this period, 1990 to about 2030, this country as all the European, the so-called wealthy nations, are going to be facing unprecedented migration pressure. We were formed to help articulate a policy which would help stabilize population and make immigration responsive to the political will of the people. Well, we now have enough <coughs> Ill illegal immigrants in this country awaiting hearings yeah. equal to the population of Chicago. Right. On the southern, in Southern California, they come across the border at the rate of something like a million a year. Some are caught, sent back, most of them are not. Right. What is your agenda? Well, we want to, first of all, the, the political leadership of this country has utterly failed to recognize the changing magnitude of immigration pressure to this country. We have an enormous number of people worldwide who would like to come. They watch TV programs produced in California. They think life in America is what they see now on TV. We create through mixed messages situations like what we have from China, where we seem to be guaranteeing people the right to stay if they come illegally and make a phony asylum claim. We want to help give the American people the guidance as best we can on how we can stop illegal immigration and answer three basic questions. How many are you going to admit every year? Who are they going to be? And then how you enforce the rules? Right now, we can't even enforce the rules, so the first two questions really don't matter. Well, let's, get, let's go to those, one of those first two questions. You make much of the fact, and it is a striking fact, that last year more foreign people were granted the right to work in this country than there were jobs created by the economy. Two questions. Is it not the case that if the, some of these, say, illegal immigrants had not taken those jobs, the jobs would not have been filled? And what do you say to those economists who give a careful analysis and say that immigration still is adding value to the economy? It's not costing Americans. Wait, wait. You're, when you're giving out more work documents than the entire economy's creating jobs, I think we've got to take a dry-eyed look that that is a trend that could not continue without the public becoming resentful. Illegal immigration in particular creates an, uh, uh, an underground network. It, it, it degrades unskilled labor in this country. It makes it less valuable. And we are developing a two-tier labor market, which is eroding the stable American middle class on which our democratic ideals depend. If you allow employers to bring illegal workers in, you might attract capital to get some sweatshop industries going. And in fact, now in cities like New York and LA, we've got labor market conditions we haven't seen since the turn of the century. And if we're going to try to compete on a wage basis with Taiwan, with Mexico, uh, with, with low value added uh, manufacturing countries, I mean, that's the wrong direction for the United States to be going, particularly when immigration is putting a lot of pressure on American schools, which right now are not doing the job anyway for our own people. Well, one of the arguments that's been made about the underclass in the United States is that they are trapped because there are no entry-level jobs. Mm -hmm. Yet we have people traveling 10,000 miles across the oceans in rickety small boats to get here, and they find entry-level jobs, and they rise into the middle class. 
Why isn't it the case that the American people ought to want exactly that kind of person who'll travel 10,000 miles to go to work here? Well, if you try to bring people in who are very desperate, who believe that their children are going to live the American dream, they are willing to accept a very arbitrary set of wages and working conditions. Unlimited immigration ended in this country. It had to have ended with the New Deal. When you guarantee people basic public education, uh, medical care, a so-called social but safety net. But don't many net, of their children wind up living the American dream? Well, the number coming in right now dwarfs anything we've ever seen in a similar period in American history. We took more immigrants in the last three years than during the whole period, 1607 to 1850. There are three and a half million people waiting in line. The people who got amnesty in 86 are going to start wanting to bring in their relatives next year because they're going to become citizens. The, the whole process is totally out of control, and, it's, and everybody, I think, who studies this issue responsibly recognizes that immigration has impaired the wages and working conditions for Americans with less than a high school degree. The, the, the numbers are dwarfed, but not the percentages. I mean, you're using percentages from the 1800s and yeah. trying to apply them today. I mean, we have fewer immigrants coming in today than we did in the great waves of the 1800s. But let me ask you about... You mean as a percentage of our yes. native population? Well, yes. we'd have to bring in 10 million people a year to match the peak periods at the turn of the century, but there were only four years where immigration exceeded a million. More people can come into this country in one second, Sam, than could come in over three or four years during the colonial era. When, in the colonial era, we the moved The numbers, that's the quite correct. Yeah. But the percentage of our population... I think it's not nearly well, the same. You're saying so China should be taking in more immigrants because um, they have more no, people. We're talking, Where about does that the, lead we're talking about the United States. Let me just ask you about a, que a sure. statement that Pat Buchanan, the presidential candidate from last year, made. Mm -hmm. He said, if present trends continue, by the year 2050, uh, white Americans will be in a minority. Apparently that worries Mr. Buchanan. Does that worry you? It doesn't worry me specifically. It's very important that new immigrants, when they come, receive proper grounding in the basis of American political democracy. That means, you know, proper grounding in the political documents which led to the framing of the Constitution and what it means to be a full-fledged democratic participant. When you have political leaders who send messages like uh, like well, so you're not just trying to keep bilingual ballots. Non We're saying you know, it's not really. Oh, of course not. You know, it's non-European. This, this oughtn't to be a racial issue, and it <clears> certainly <throat> shouldn't be discriminatory. Frankly, what we think we need right now is a timeout or a freeze or a moratorium on immigration, just like we had from about 1920 uh, to about 1975. You're which, proposing which is that very Congress beneficial. freeze immigration right now? No one to freeze in? immigration and get the illegal situation cleaned up because now we have no political control. We have lost. As a, de as a democratic people, the consent of the majority is gone. The, it is the immigrants themselves who are deciding whether or not they come. How, George, we've got a few seconds left. Simply, how, King Canute, do you freeze a tide? Well, you see, it, the, the, most political leaders don't understand that illegal and legal are very closely linked. The illegals are coming mostly from <coughs> countries where we have lots of legal, because the family chain situation creates expectations and sends information back and forth that leads to migration. If you start sending a signal now that we're going to stop taking preference uh, quota numbers, then people will realize that they're not going to become, at that point, you can <coughs> restructure the law and shut the flow down and bring the numbers down. Mr. Stein, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. My pleasure to have you.